Look at this map. This is Latin America a decade before insurgencies throughout the region paved the way for the creation of a bunch of independent countries in the 1820s. Notice the number of political divisions. Had these colonial borders translated into new nations, the Latin American mainland would have had between five and six countries. Instead, by 1830, there were 16. The divisions happened entirely within Spanish America, however. While its Spanish neighbors disintegrated into various sized republics, the Portuguese counterpart stayed entirely intact. Why? Why did Brazil not break apart while the rest of Latin America did? The answer begins with the fact that the consequences of Napoleon's Iberian invasion in 1808, the original catalyst for independence for both regions, manifested themselves in different ways in the two Americas. In Spanish America, because the invasion led to the forced abdication of Ferdinand VII in favor of Napoleon's brother Joseph, and because Spanish authority was supposed to derive in its entirety from the king, it wasn't clear who should rule, leading to popular sovereignty movements throughout the Spanish domains, which would soon become lengthy civil wars, especially as these divisions also occurred in Spain itself. That never occurred in Portuguese America because the Portuguese crown was not only able to escape Napoleon's troops, but found safety in Brazil. Although nearly 15 years later, a war of independence did break out between Brazil and Portugal, the independence side rallied around Dom Pedro I, heir to the Portuguese crown, so political disagreements over who should rule Brazil were minimal. Meanwhile, not only were these disagreements vast in Spanish America, but they hardened into political differences between liberals and conservatives, which kept the region enmeshed in civil wars until 1850 or so. Still, Brazil's advantage didn't last for too long. Political turmoil forced the Brazilian emperor, Dom Pedro, to return to Portugal to ensure the Portuguese throne remained in the hands of his daughter and not those of his brother, Miguel. The emperor won the war against the Miguelistas, but died within months. This left his son, Dom Pedro II, a not quite six-year-old, technically as ruler of Brazil, in a regency temporarily in charge. This severely weakened the empire, and the same dynamics that surfaced in Spanish America began to show up in Brazil. In the next decade or so, there were multiple rebellions including one that lasted 10 years as an independent territory. Some of these were secessionists, some were abolitionists, all required massive resources to put down, and thus could have led to the splintering of the country directly or indirectly. What saved Brazil were two fundamental dynamics. The first was fear of slave revolts in the potential secessionist republics. Without the resources from the central government, the elite of the various regions worried that slave revolts like that of the Malays and Bahia might succeed, so independence was a non-starter. The second was that coffee planters from Rio, which came to dominate Brazilian politics and happened to have plenty of money because of the new global demand of coffee, needed outside support to keep the liberals in check, and so a deal was made. Thus, the potentially secessionist republics gave up independence in exchange for security and resources, while the center gave up resources in exchange for political support, a kind of clientelistic relationship that would keep Brazil a colossus, but would not always be so positive for the country's future.